Good day everyone and welcome to our first lesson. In this video, we will be dealing with the introduction to transport phenomena. This introduction serves a very important purpose and that is to acquaint you to the intricacies of transport phenomena. So let's begin. Before we start, here are some of the important things to review that will be needed in this course. So throughout our calculations, you will be needing all of this. First is calculus. Calculus plays a key role in the derivation of some equations in this course. That is differentiation, integration, and multivariable calculus. Next is units and dimensions. Please review that topic very carefully because all of our calculations would involve actual units and dimensions. Next, numerical solutions to complex problems. This involves iteration. And this also involves numerical integration and differentiation because we might be using those in some of the problems. And lastly, the most important is you need to recover and make sure that your imagination and common sense are working. Because in all of the problems that we will be solving, you need to imagine the system in order for you to fully understand the mechanisms behind it. Okay, so with that, let's begin. The nature of transport phenomena. If you look around you, or if you take a look at the world around you, transport phenomena manifest itself in many ordinary processes or activities around you. So let me give you an example. Let's make a cup of coffee, coming from instant coffee and hot water. To make your cup of coffee, first you have to boil your water. The boiling of water entails heat transfer, one of the transport phenomena. The pouring of water into the cup entails momentum transfer, another one of the transport phenomena. And by mixing the solution, you are dissolving the powder into the hot water, and that entails mass transfer, the third transport phenomena. There are several other daily activities that you are doing that entail transport phenomena without you knowing them. So in this course, it's our objective to perform calculations to demystify those transport phenomena. As I have mentioned, we have three types of transport phenomena. That's momentum transport, which deals with fluid mechanics, heat transport, which deals with heat transfer, and mass transport, dealing with mass transfer. In CH1 to 8P, we will be discussing the basics of each of these transport phenomena, while most of the macro scale applications of this transport phenomena will be discussed in separate courses. For example, Fluid mechanics is discussed in a separate course as well as heat and mass transfer. Let's take a look at the molecular level of things. No? In the molecular level, things behave differently than here at the macroscopic level. Okay? Transport phenomena are happening in a molecular scale and the microscopic changes add up to macroscopic observations. So in a way, the macroscopic observations that we have are just the average of those of the microscopic observations. Let's first deal with momentum transport. In momentum transport, molecular momentum is passed from high velocity molecules to low velocity molecules. So this involves the collision of molecules in order for them to pass their momentum. Momentum, as defined in physics, is the product of the mass and the velocity of the particle. In this instance, we are using density instead of mass. Let's consider heat transport. So for heat transport, instead of momentum, molecular thermal energy is transferred instead, and energy is passed from high energy molecules to low energy molecules. Depicted in this diagram are molecules that are vibrating. This molecule is vibrating faster than the rest of the molecules. That means that this molecule is at a higher temperature than the other molecules, okay? So the transfer of molecular energy or the transfer of heat according to the second law of thermodynamics is always from a high temperature to a low temperature. So that also means that the transfer of energy on the molecular level is from high energy molecules to low energy molecules. That molecular phenomena is what we observe in the macroscopic world as heat conduction which we will discuss in a future lesson. In mass transport, the molecules themselves are transferred from high concentration to low concentration of the species. 
you are already familiar with the macroscopic ramifications of mass transfer, no? Let's say, for example, if you're mixing a dye in water, that entails mass transfer. Because even if you don't stir the solution, the dye particles would then eventually spread all throughout the matrix of the water. Because the dye molecules are moving from regions of high concentration to regions of low concentration. Next, let's talk about the mechanisms of transport. In order for you to easily understand the mechanisms of transport, we can illustrate this process as you placing an ice cube in a glass of water. Let's say, for example, you want to drink something cold, but your water is warm. So we placed an ice cube in that glass of water. Now you are very thirsty and you want to drink cold water immediately. So what do you do to speed the cooling process? You can either stir your glass of water or you can shake the glass of water with the ice to speed the cooling process. And that demonstrates what we call turbulent transport. So turbulent transport can be thought of as chaotic but fast. So with you shaking the water containing the ice, you are introducing chaos. But by introducing chaos, you are making sure that the transfer of energy from the warm water to the cold ice occurs at a very fast rate. Okay? If you don't shake the water with the ice or if you don't steer the ice into the water, what happens is what we call a molecular transport. So molecular transport in contrast with turbulent transport is orderly but it is slow compared to turbulent transport. So if you just have a glass of water and you simply let the cube of ice sit on that glass of water, then that glass of water would get cold eventually but the process is slower than with you stirring the ice cube. Okay, so that's the difference between molecular transport and turbulent transport. So in our future lessons, you would easily spot the difference between molecular and turbulent transport because the governing equations are different for those two mechanisms. For molecular transport, we have developed equations to describe the behavior of systems. But for turbulent transport, since it is very chaotic, it's very difficult to define equations that generalize the nature of turbulent transport. In your fluid mechanics course, you will be encountering two key terms, and that is laminar and turbulent. So laminar is very orderly flow. It's also slow, and that is akin to molecular transport, while turbulent flow is very fast, but it's very chaotic, and that is akin to turbulent transport. Okay? Next, we now know that there are three transport phenomena. And we now know that they transfer different stuff, but they do have some things in common. Molecular transport phenomena have a few things in common. First, they all tend to transport something. Momentum transfer transfers momentum. Heat transfer transfers energy. And mass transfer, of course, transfers mass. Another thing they have in common is they all tend to transport something from high to low. So for momentum transport, the general direction is the transfer from high velocity to low velocity. For heat transfer, it occurs from high temperature to low temperature. And for mass transfer, it occurs from high concentration to low concentration. With all of those things in common, we would expect that the governing equations for those three transport phenomena would also look similar. And we call those phenomenological laws. This is the general transport equation which describes momentum, heat, and mass transfer. Okay? The molecular transport mechanism of the three transport phenomena follow this general equation. This is psi z is equal to negative del multiplied by the ratio d gamma over d z. So what are these parameters? The parameter psi, we call that the property flux. The flux is defined as the ratio of the rate of transfer over the area of transfer. The del here is what we call the diffusivity. And for momentum, heat, and mass transfer, the diffusivities are momentum diffusivity, thermal diffusivity, and mass diffusivity. The gamma here 
is the transported property. So for momentum transfer, that is momentum or velocity. For heat transfer, that is energy or temperature. And for mass transfer, that is concentration. Okay? And Z is the general direction of transfer. So we are using here a Cartesian coordinate system with X, Y, and Z. So you can use either X, Y, and Z as the direction of transfer. This general transport equation can also be written as this general equation of rate is equal to driving force over resistance. This equation is very similar to Ohm's law. So let me demonstrate. If you will remember from physics, Ohm's law, we know that it is V is equal to I times R. But if I'm going to rewrite this, we have I is equal to V over R. Wherein I is the current, and current is the rate at which electrons are traveling. V is the voltage, or this is the potential difference. Potential difference meaning that there must be a difference in potential between two points of a conductor in order for the electrons to flow. So we can also think of the voltage as our driving force. Or the driving force is what allows the property to be transported. And finally, R is the resistance. It's the one that is countering the flow of the property. Okay? This Ohm's law is very similar to our phenomenological equation of rate is equal to driving force over resistance. How do we apply this with the transport equations? Let's start with the simplest. Let's consider heat transport. From your studies in thermodynamics, you know that the spontaneous transfer of energy occurs from a body of high temperature to a body of low temperature. So if you don't have a difference in temperature, there will be no heat transfer. Let's say, for example, that you have two bodies, body A, which is at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, and body B, which is also at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Now, based on the laws of thermodynamics, if I place bodies A and B together, they must be exchanging heat if they are at a different temperatures. But since they are at the same temperature, then there will be no heat transfer because they are in thermal equilibrium. That is the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Okay? But if one of them has a different temperature with the other, let's say, for example, that body B is now 20 degrees Celsius, if you place them together, wherein body A is 100 degrees Celsius, body B is 20 degrees Celsius, you expect that the energy would transfer from the body of high temperature to the body of low temperature. So we say that this is the general direction of the transfer of heat. So bringing this back to our topic, for this scenario, what is your driving force? The driving force in this case is the difference in temperature, which allows energy to flow from high temperature to low temperature. So we say that the driving force for heat transfer is the difference in temperature. This difference in temperature is always relative. It's relative to how long or what distance would the energy be traveling in. So that would be covered by a hypothetical distance delta z. So our driving force is actually what we call a gradient. A gradient is a difference in values within two points of a material. In this case, we say that we have a gradient of temperature along the distance delta z. This is our driving force. Okay. What about resistance? What is the resistance to the transfer of heat from body A to body B? The resistance in this case is dependent on is dependent on a lot of factors, such as what materials are bodies A and B made of, what are the heat capacity, and what are the thermal conductivity of those materials. Those are the things that factor into the resistance. Okay? Going back. Now, let's apply the general transport equation to the three transport phenomena. And let's take a look at the equations governing molecular transfer for the three transport phenomena. 
let's start with momentum transfer. Momentum transport is governed by Newton's law of viscosity. This is the general equation for Newton's law of viscosity. This is tau. Tau is the shear stress experienced by the fluid elements. It's also called the momentum flux. Okay? That's equal to negative nu. Nu, in this case, is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. This is not V. Okay? This is the Greek letter nu. The kinematic viscosity of the fluid is also called the momentum diffusivity of the fluid. Going back to the general transport equation, we have the flux is equal to the diffusivity multiplied by the gradient. Now, what is our gradient in momentum transfer? The gradient is the difference in velocity with respect to position. Because, of course, momentum will be transferred from regions of high velocity to regions of low velocity. So it makes sense that our driving force in this case would be difference in velocities. Okay? This differential is the change in momentum with respect to change in position. Now let's go to heat transfer. We see that we have a very similar equation. We have Q is equal to negative alpha times the gradient. The molecular heat transport is governed by Fourier's law of conduction. This is the heat flux. This is akin to momentum flux in momentum transfer. That's equal to the thermal diffusivity. This is also akin to the momentum diffusivity in momentum transport multiplied by the gradient. The gradient in this case is difference in temperature. So as I have mentioned earlier for heat transfer, the driving force is difference in temperature because if there's no difference in temperature, heat will not flow. Okay? So this differential is the change in temperature with respect to the change in position. Now let's take a look at mass transfer. We see that we have the same form of the equation. So this J is called the mass flux. This is equal to the mass diffusivity or the diffusion coefficient of the system multiplied by the gradient. Our gradient in this case is the change in concentration or the difference in concentration. This is the change in concentration with respect to the change in position. This equation is called the fixed first law. Okay? And we will tackle this in later lessons. So you see that they are based in a general equation. So of course, they should have the same features. So in here, I have a table comparing momentum, heat, and mass transport with regards to their similarities and differences. First, let's take a look at the flux. We have here momentum flux that's equal to the shear force over area. We have the heat flux that's equal to the rate of heat transfer over area. And we have the mass flux, which is the rate of mass transfer over area. So they are very similar. Next is the driving force or the gradients. For momentum transfer, what allows momentum to be transferred is the difference in velocity with respect to position. For heat transfer, that gradient is difference in temperature with respect to position. And for mass transfer, that's difference in concentration with respect to position. Next, we take a look at their diffusivities. For momentum transfer, we have the momentum diffusivity or the kinematic viscosity. For heat transfer, we have the thermal diffusivity. And for mass transfer, we have the mass diffusivity. Next, what is the transferring quantity or what property is being transferred? For momentum, we are transferring momentum or molecular velocity. For heat transfer, we are transferring molecular energy or temperature. And for mass transfer, we are transferring the molecules themselves or concentration. Uh, and this is another similarity of them. What is the general direction of transfer? It's always from high to low. High velocity to low velocity, high temperature to low temperature, and high concentration to low concentration. Okay? So they are very similar with each other. Next, transport properties. Transport properties are very important because they allow us to quantify the rate of transfer. Transport properties include diffusivities, 
The diffusivities of the three molecular transport phenomena are important in understanding the nature of such phenomena. So we have three diffusivities, momentum, thermal, and mass diffusivities. They might be different in their definitions, but they have the same dimensions. Their dimensions are length squared over time. This means that, let's say for example, we are using the SI system. The units of the diffusivities should be the same and they should be square meters per second. Okay? So they all have the same dimensions. Since we will be dealing with transport properties, you need to be familiar with the following properties that will be used heavily in our future lessons. Those are density, which is the ratio of mass over volume, absolute viscosity, or the measure of the resistance of the fluid to flow, thermal conductivity, K, heat capacity, Cp, and diffusion coefficient, Dab. Now, all of these properties are functions of temperature and pressure, but in most of our calculations, we will only be considering their dependence with temperature because some of these are less dependent to pressure. Okay? These are the definitions of the diffusivities. So, momentum diffusivity or kinematic viscosity is defined as nu is equal to absolute viscosity over density. Thermal diffusivity is defined as K or thermal conductivity over density times heat capacity. And mass diffusivity is not defined in terms of other properties. It's simply just DAB. Okay? Now that you are familiar with the transport properties, the question is, where can you find values for those transport properties? So for solving problems, we need to know where to get values for those transport properties. And we can get those from our handbook. That's Perry's Chemical Engineer's Handbook. You need to have a copy of this handbook because whenever we have exams, you will be required to look for the values of the transport properties involved in your calculations. Okay? I will be teaching you how to obtain the value of the properties from our handbook. Let's start with a common example. Let's assume that we have water at 30 degrees Celsius. Normally for transport properties, all you need to know is the temperature of the substance. Okay? So for water at 30 degrees Celsius, let's solve for the density, the absolute viscosity, the thermal conductivity, and the heat capacity of the substance. All of this will be coming from your handbook. Let's start with density. The tables for the density of water can be found in Chapter 2 of the handbook. So in Chapter 2, you simply look for the densities of pure substances. Here we have the densities of pure substances under Chapter 2. And on Table 2-30, we have the density of saturated liquid water from the triple point to the critical point. So let's take a look at that table. This is... Uh, table 2-30. From here, if you're given the temperature of water, you can easily determine its density. Our temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. We just need we just need to convert that to Kelvin. So that is just 30 plus 273.15. We have 303.15 Kelvin. Now take a look at the table and you find 303.15 Kelvin. You might have noticed that there is no 303.15 Kelvin here, but what we have are 302 and 304 Kelvin. That means that you need to interpolate. I believe that you already know how to interpolate because that was discussed in thermodynamics. So let's interpolate here. At a temperature of 302 Kelvin, the density is 995.948. The unit is kilogram per cubic meter and at a temperature of 304 Kelvin the density is 995.346 kilograms per cubic meter so let's interpolate our temperature is 303.15 Kelvin that's minus 302 divided by 304 minus 
302. Now we multiply this to the to the we multiply this to the difference in densities. That's 995.346 minus 995.948 plus 995.948. That is the density of water at 30 degrees Celsius. That is 995.602 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so for liquid water, the determination of density is straightforward. You just have to look at a single table. Now for the density of different substances, let's take a look at the given. If your substance is no longer water, we have table 2-32, which are the densities of inorganic and organic liquids. But it is in mole per cubic decimeter. So let's take a look at that table. This is your table for the densities of other organic and inorganic liquids besides water. So you can use this table as well. Okay? The way we use this table is you identify your compound. Let's use metasilene as an example. So for metasilene, as you can see in this table, there are values of constants. Those constants are C1, C2, C3, and C4. So you just have to get the values of C1, C2, C3, and C4 for metasilene. These are those values. Okay, so these are the values for metasilene. That's C1, C2, C3, and C4. And substitute them in this equation. Density is equal to C1 over C2 raised to something. Okay? So substitute C1 to C4 in that equation, and you will get the density of metasilene. Okay, so for other substances, we use table 2-32. Now let's go back to water. We're done with the density. Let's go to the viscosity. The viscosity of substances is covered in a separate table. Let's look for that table. You go to chapter 2, and then you look for transport properties. Okay. So for transport properties, we have on table 2-313, the viscosity of organic and inorganic liquids. So let's go to that table. Okay. This is our table. This is similar to the table for the density of other organic and inorganic liquids. For the viscosity, we have five constants. We have C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. Okay, so let's look for water. Okay, here are the constants for water. Let me first list them. C1 is negative 52.843. C2 is 3703.6. C3 is 5.866. C4 is negative 5.879 times 10 raised to negative 29. And C5 is 10. Now remember, our temperature is 303.15 Kelvin. We are required to substitute the temperature in this case in Kelvins. This is our governing equation. The liquid viscosity is calculated by the following equation. Mu is equal to exponential of C1 plus C2 over T plus C3 ln of T plus C4 times T raised to C5. So let's input that in our calculator. Okay, so that is exponential E raised to C1. C1 is negative 52.843 plus C2 over T, 3703.6 divided by our temperature, 303.15 Kelvin, plus C3, 5. 866 times 
ln of t, 303.15. Plus C4, that's negative, so that's minus 5.879 times 10 raised to negative 29 times temperature 303.15 raised to C5, 10. And this is our value of the viscosity. So the viscosity of water at 30 degrees Celsius is 8.196 times 10 raised to negative 4. The units provided in the handbook is Pascal seconds. Okay, so that is how we determine viscosity. So we're done with density. We're done with viscosity. Let's now consider thermal conductivity. So the table for thermal conductivity still falls under transport properties. So transport properties. Okay, table table 2-315, that's the thermal conductivity of inorganic and organic liquids. So we have the same table. We also have uh, five constants from C1 to C5. Let's look for water. These are the constants for water. We only have C1, C2, C3, and C4. C5 is understood to be zero here. And the thermal conductivity equation is more straightforward. It's just a polynomial equation. Let's try to solve. So the thermal conductivity is C1, negative 0.432, plus C2, 0 0.005255, times T, our temperature is 303.15 Kelvin, minus 0 0.00008078, times Temperature squared, 303.15 squared, plus C4 times C4 times T cubed. So C4 is 1.861 times 10 raised to negative 9 times 303.15 cubed. Okay, here is our thermal conductivity for water at 30 degrees Celsius. That is 0 0.613 watts per meter per Kelvin. Okay, it's the same process. You just have to substitute the constants and the temperature to the governing equation. Last, heat capacity. So for heat capacity, it can still be found in chapter 2. Okay, specific heats of pure compounds. So for water, we can find that in table 2-153, heat capacities of inorganic and organic liquids. So let's go to that table. In this table, we still have five constants from C1 to C5. Let's take a look at the equation. Okay, we have two equations here. For the 11 substances, ammonia, etc., you calculate the heat capacity using equation 2, which is very complicated. For all of the other compounds, you simply use equation number 1. Okay, so the heat capacity of water can be computed using equation 1. These are the constants of water from C1 to C5. You simply substitute these constants to this polynomial equation along with the temperature and you have the value of heat capacity. So I will be leaving the solving of the heat capacity to you as a practice. And that's the end of our lecture. If you have any questions, 
you can drop in during our consultations every Sundays, or you can message me through course messages. Okay? I hope you have learned something, and as always, keep safe. Thank <laughs> you.